Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe in which we're playing as the Empire of Japan. It is now September 16th, 1962, but we have to be learning what we will learn. Now, gentlemen, said Detective Kodaira, pausing to take a sip of his coffee from the mug in his right hand, the simple matter is, I can't accept that a man can be dismembered, defaced, and dumped in a vat of... That of tuna on a whim. That notion simply does not sit right to my mind. In all my years of experience, no one has ever involved a vat of tuna in their plans by accident. Because of that, gentlemen, we will be taking nothing for granted in this case. For us, there is no such thing as a benefit of the doubt. The word coincidence has no use here. Nine members of the Tokyo Police Service at sat in chairs, leaned against a desk, or stood in a half circle in front of him. They were a mix of street officers, desk workers, and junior detectives. Some listened with blank, expectant stares, while others were stern and cold, frowning as a mule as they mulled over the senior detective words. With that said, he continued, "We will be conducting a thorough examination of the." particulars of this case. The purpose of that examination is to answer the key question of why. Why did the killing take place when it took place? Why was the victim disfigured in the way that he was? And most of all, why did our suspect pick that particular tuna vat out of all the tuna vats in Tokyo? Those are the questions I want to answer, or I want answers to, and trust me, I will give my answers one way or another. He let the last sentence settle over with his men, gauging the reactions or lack thereof. To achieve that goal, there are two paths that have been laid before us. We can go low, down into the factory floor and see what we can pull from the fish guts and bones. Or, we can go high, up to the owners and financiers of the whole operation and see how far the paper trail takes us. Given our prior issues with security and obtaining evidence, it seems pretty clear that the correct move is to investigate the plant, investigate the owners. Particular vats of tuna, or the plant, I kind of want to say the plant itself, because we did, we should have selected that maybe before in the earlier... Uh, campaign episodes. I kind of want to see what the owners are up to, though. Maybe Ooh. go down to the factory floor and see what we can pull from the fish guts and bones. Well, technically, we've already tried that, didn't we? Or we saw maybe what was inside there. Or we can go high up to the owners and financiers of the whole operation. Hmm. It seems like no matter what, there's a good chance the owners actually have nothing wrong with them. But let's do it anyways, because why not? And we have a hospital call. Hayashi leaned his bike towards his home, a hut made out of wood, close to the sea. Letting the wall support it from falling, he took his glasses from his shirt pocket and looked into the sea, where the sun was halfway across the horizon. The electric light, strung like a pearl necklace, began turning on, faint but evanescent against the incandescence. Waves lapped the gray sand of the coast with pieces of the wet floatsome strewn across its surface. When his eyes passed through the lenses, he saw the world. The blobs and blotches became sharp, defined. The miracles of modern science, he thought that there was nothing wrong with his eyes up until his local doctor recommended him an optician. Wearing his first pair of spectacles was an experience, a discovery he had never seen the world so clearly as he did under the eaves of two concave lenses. Father, a voice said from the inside, are you there? The doorknob turned and Takeshi stepped out, the last shreds of sunlight dying on the slopes of his chin. A plain-faced young man whose work in a dirty marketplace concealed a brilliant mind. A scholarship in Tokyo. Hayashi was proud. The kid would go far. There you are, Takashi said, smiling, trying to hide his worrisome gleam in his eyes. How was the catch? Rough, Hayashi said, downcast. We all have enough, however. The situation has become awkward. Well, well Takashi stammered. A cane is in the hospital. Hayashi's eyes widened. The 17-year-old Akane, at the cusp of her youth, had to lie in a hospital bed, afflicted with illness. Stri straining his bike, Hayashi said to his son, I won't be home for dinner tonight. What illness? Oh my goodness, and here we go again. Also, I started up the game again, because, you know, every day, I don't record, like, one episode usually after another. I usually, like, give a day a break, or, you know, do this one at a time, and every day I come back into a little bit of time. Well, I thought we ended yesterday that we had a deficit, but now we... Well, we ended with a negative deficit, but now we have a positive deficit, which is... Strange, but whatever. The first floor of the ivory tower. The investigative team began by collecting and reviewing any and all easily accessible public information regarding the plant where Shinji Yoshikage's body had been found. This included everything from the plant's articles of incorporation and bylaws to their land and development permits. The plant's official name was a Tokuku Regional Seafood Processing Plant, a name which rolled off the tongue like a brick on a plane. It had been established five years prior. Five years. The property had previously been an abandoned warehouse but was quickly converted into its current industrial state at the whim of a plucky investor. Said investor went by the name of Morihiro Sojima, a local Tokyo socialite and entrepreneur. He was a direct owner and operating manager of the plant, but it seemed that in recent years, most of the day-to-day -day operations of the plant were administered by a series of lower-level managers. During that time, Sojima had been busy starting and launching a host 
most of other businesses in and around Tokyo, ranging from other food processing plants to naval equipment factories. At first, the team was skeptical of how this was possible given the relative cost of opening and converting properties versus the profits they generated, but two facts came to light that provided easy explanations. First, the plant. In addition to all other properties owned by Sojima, a part of a water consumer industrial conglomerate named Minizaka Koshu Kabushiki Gaisha. It was immediately obvious that the conglomerate provided the necessary capital and backing to support the ambitious expansion plan. Second, Mor Morihiro Sojima was the eldest of, a Sh of Shinzo Sojima, a respected member of the prestigious and powerful Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly, Tokyo's primary legislative body. Either of these facts could have been connected to the motivation behind Yoshikage's symbolic murder, perhaps the end result of industrial espionage or political subterfuge. Regardless, the team was forced to consolidate their efforts and focus on the chosen approach. The conglomerate? Focus on the father. Ooh, I mean, it could be the father, maybe. But I kind of I kinda like the conglomerate the business dealings, maybe. You never know. They could be leading to other connections to other businesses that could have problems, maybe. Mm. Backing of the to support the ambitious plans. There's a son of this other guy. Ooh. Hmm. I, I want to do the business, but let's, let's focus on the father. Let's see what happens with the father. With Daddy Shojima. A diagnosis. Hush, Hayashi-san, the doctor said. His words clad in a clinical concern as spick and span as his lab coat. Please follow me to my room. We need to discuss the specifics of Akan, Akane chans situation. Hayashi was familiar with such demeanor. The medic in his old platoon often carried the very same wary and stoic expression whenever he had to convey bad news. Trailing behind the door, Hayashi glanced at the w past the window at the high silhouette that blocked his view to the sea. The chemical factory, one of Minamata's proudest centers of employment, loomed its white pipes directed coastward. Entering the doctor's room, they sat down across from one another. The doctor sat behind his desk, pulling out a file of the drawer. Monochrome photographs seemed to spill out of the manila-covered cover. I am sure, the doctor said, that you have seen... Akane Chan's symptoms over the past few weeks. Stammered words, uneven guilt, or galt, or gait, and strange convolutions. Fingers that curl into claws. I have, as a father, Hayashi could only give answers that might help speed his doctor, his daughter's recovery and let the medicine men go to work. Do you know the cause? After a brief pause, the doctor answered. See these photographs here? Fingers, weak muscles, twisted limbs. I know you're not the one to be peeved at this sort of thing, Hayashi-san. Hayashi nodded. The doctor was right. All the victims have had the same kind of diet, fish or shellfish. Don't take my word for it, he stroked his chin, but I think the factory over there might be a s suspect. Heavy metal poisoning. Akane or H Akan is one of the lighter cases, but it'll better be if she doesn't eat fish from the Minamata area. Are you sure that's the fault of the factory? 70 to 80 percent, yeah. Hayashi immediately knew what to do. A father's love lies in above heaven and earth. Oh crap, maybe we should invest at the gate of the plant and the businesses. Oh crap. Now we read about maybe things that could have gone really poorly. Ah. Oh. A gatekeeper. For Hayashi today, it should have been another day of work. As a soldier turned fisherman, he didn't have much time for holidays or vacations. Takeshi and Akane depended on him at the very least. He would see them complete their educations. To his children, as to his state, duty was everything. And the bright glare of the morning sunlight near the factory's opening hours as the winds were blowing out to the sea, he and the local veterans stood by its gate, preventing anyone from leaving and entering. When the police came to dissuade them, they brandished their rifles and machetes, rendered no less dull nor deadly by the years spent in unuse. When the police threatened to evict them forcibly from the premises, they fired a few warning shots, finally as their last resort. The police sent a friend of Hayashi's, a local bar owner, to meet with them. From a distance, he looked ridiculous, the skin and complexion of a man unused to exertions happening under the sunlight, much less in the early morning. Hayashi-san, the bar owner asked, or said, have you gone mad? Have you cracked? If you stand down now, they'll let you go. You're a veteran, Hayashi-san, that you respect that. Not enough, Hayashi said. Apparently, me and the boys here have only one condition, a meeting with any official. Scratch that, preferential, a prefectural officials. I need someone who can do something regarding this, he pointed his chin at the factory. This is monstrosity, that's all. I'll stand down once I know who I'm talking to. By the midday, the news had spread across the country. In the evening, it would reach the ears of Prime Minister Eno. A new scandal, the apple and the tree. For an ostensibly public figure, Shinzo Sujima at times seemed as distant as the Emperor himself, and although his position on the Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly was much lower rank than that, his grasp on the seat was just as firm. He had first come to occupy the predecessor to the prestigious legislative portion, or position shortly before the outbreak of the Second War against the Chinese, when he was just 36. Previously, he had been a partner in the respected corporate law firm, but was swept into the politics by the winds of change that had blown through Japan at the start of the century. After nearly three years of service, his name had not come to mean much to the general public of Tokyo, but within the halls and offices of the sprawling city, his name carried some considerable weight. 
His reputation stemmed mostly from his performance on the major administration projects that the city had take, overtaken or undertaken over the years. He'd been instrumental in the merger of the Tokyo City bureaucracies into a modern Tokyo metropolitan government that the country knew today. He was particularly involved with the design and implementation of the sub-governments of Tokyo's districts, including the maze of tax codes, zoning laws, regulations that accompanied them, of course. This all stood in stark contrast to his garish and grandilo grandilo grandiloquent son, Morihiro Sujima. It was a point of debate among the detective whether his attitude towards his only child was indicative of distant approval or silent contempt. They seemed to only appear together at the most important of state ceremonies, otherwise they lived diametrically opposed laws on what some seemed to be entirely different planets. So what then? Was this titan of administration's relation to this confused mess of a case? Was it merely circumstantial association by the actions of a foolhardy son, or something more? We shall see. And take a sip of water. Gotta love that water. Aqua in a quandary, every day took... Takeda drove Prime Minister Ino to his office in the National Diet. On their way there, they pressed or passed by crowds of people going to work on foot, ready to earn their living. The wooden innards of Tokyo appeared here and there, but they mostly saw only the stony modern facades of the finest commercial office complexes. Ino-sama, Takeda said to Ino. Have you decided to do what with the, uh, Takeda's voice died off as he tried to recollect his pivotal name? Minamata, veteran? He's everywhere in the news nowadays. Seemed like trouble. The Prime Minister reclined in his seat at the back of the car, deep in thought. Takeda-kun, Ino said, it has slipped my mind earlier. Thank you for reminding me. After a moment in several avenues, Takeda spoke. Takeda, ta Takeda, you know everything, you know, Ino, Ino-sama, my father's a veteran, fought in China and everything. If he knew that some big wig corporation that had put chemicals in my water, he'd be enraged in the same way that this Minamata person. Ta Takeda adjusted the rearview mirror as they stopped by a traffic light. I sympathize, is all. You're not usually this talkative. Did you find what the man did righteous? No, 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 Takeda said, stammering. I just found him understandable, coming from a veteran's family. In a lower voice, he continued, When I was little, my father would usually wake up screaming. Now, he just sits on the veranda, under the eaves, his eyes blank. He felt as if his country had left him behind. When they reached the dive building, Ino got out of the car and addressed his chauffeur. The Minamata veteran might have a point. I appreciate your advice, Takeda. A disappearance? Oh, man. A proper thing. He might have a point. I appreciate your advice. Ooh. Do we, do we want to lose Takeda or Takeda? I think it's Takeda, probably. I don't know. But, oh. I, I, it makes sense to, you know, see that the, the Minamata veteran might have a point. Maybe. That could hurt businesses, but uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. We're still trying to adjust the budget, but in the eye or the shade of the tree. As it would turn out, even if you remove the sun from the picture entirely, Shinzo Sojima had some latent connection to the Minazaka conglomerate. The first points of contact came through the old law firm he had been a partner of in the spring of 53. The firm came into contact with was what then? Uh, the Minazaka Commercial Transport Corporation. They had been contracted to help set up and register the proposed Minazaka financial investment firm, the organization's first step towards its modern structure. The investigation's efforts to locate and contact said firm revealed the second point of contact. A little over two years after closing the contract for setting up the financial firm, the rapidly expanding Minazaka conglomerate brought the firm outright, turning it into their own in-house legal team. Now, had Minazaka brought out Sujima's stake in the law firm rather than grant him direct partial ownership, officially severing any direct tie between them. But the following years contained some trends that raised a few eyebrows when closely examined the period between mid-55 and early 1960. It's an explosion of growth within the newly christened conglomerate, rocking upwards through the ranks of Japanese finance. But the size of the growth was not strictly the cause of suspicion, rather it was the speed. To open so many varied properties across so many wards would have required a nearly literal mountain of paperwork to be processed by all the various divisions and subdivisions that Sojima had so meticulously designed. Yet, given the rate at which the properties were bought and registered, the approvals must have been sent out almost as soon as the request came in. Furthermore, the modern conglomerate's most prized contracts, those of the imperial government and military, only materialized in late 1960, a few months after Minazaka quietly announced Morihiro Sojima as a new chairman. Perhaps Shino Sojima's association was merely coincidental, but it was an association nonetheless. Coincidence? I think not. I think not. We only have... Oh, we have four lines plus now. Okay. And we have minus... This is getting very weird. Minus 1.7 billion, but we do have 0.1% more growth than normal, which is nice. A proper little thing. Have you handled the matter? Eno said to the receiver. I want to see that factory closed tomorrow. No operations would resume. Noth nothing. Oh, I find out that the veteran is still there. The deal is off. I cannot protect you from the media backlash. That would... That you would have to handle yourself. I understand Eno-sama. 
the voice it over the phone belonging to a prominent tycoon who owned the Chiso Corporation. I must say this is the most uncharacteristic of you. With so much power in your hands, the Toko, the Kenpai Tai, it would have been far easier to handle this matter discreetly. Still, I would not complain. The Chiso Corporation would be more than happy to receive compensation over the government's requisition of its facilities in Minamata. The voice pauses to touch on a poignant, prominent point. Ino Sama, if I may ask, when will the transfer be? Today, tomorrow, next week, I don't know, it'll get there. I am sure as soon as I can clear the ways. You know, the usual stuff. One cannot be too careful nowadays. <clears throat> too many watchful eyes watching from the shadows. The independence of the media. Everything is a right mess over here. I admire your discretion, Ino Sama. Now, if you'll excuse me, my timeable timetable awaits. The business of conducting business. A sigh. Farewell. Killing two birds with one stone. Hopefully he doesn't come back and bite us in the butt. But at least we shut down the factory for now. Fixation. Kodira's team had continued to compile information regarding Shino Tsushima at the instance of the detective himself. Ever since the details of Tsushima's relationship with the Minazaka conglomerate had begun to come to light, he had fixated all his attention on the reserved councilman. In his view, the case was reducible to three points. The councilman, his son, and the plant owned by the conglomerate. Their job, according to Kodera, oh, Kodara, was to draw the lines between them and find where they all intersect. So, the team poured... Uh, that's a poured through the files that they collected, highlighting every overlap and relationship where they could not be found, and speculating about their existence where they could not. Nothing taken for granted, nothing less a chance. As it would happen, Kodaira's analysis was off by one point, placed dead in the center of the other three. One of the officers had been examining Councilman Sojima's recent political projects when he found one detailing a recent restructuring effort in Tokyo's central tax office. He nearly passed over the document entirely, but suddenly a name appeared amidst the blocks of text. Shinji Yoshikage, the victim himself. He had been chosen for a position in the Tokyo Tax Office Department responsible for analyzing and proposing changes to the city's tax code. His appointment came as a result of his years of prior service in the local tax offices and audit departments of various ward governments. There is no evidence to suggest Sojima had selected Yoshikage personally, but it was still his signature at the bottom of the page, yet that was enough for Kodira, or Kodaira to rally his team around his selected strategy and pursue it with renewed vigor. I knew it. I'm not, I'm not sure if you'd actually pronounce it like that, but I knew it. Wow. Baratia is not giving up until they literally all die. Sablin, what are you doing, son? Valerie, don't lose now. You can kill these guys off and maybe someone. Probably not, but we'll see what happens. The political direction. Tachi frowned at the display of highlighted and annotated papers, handwritten notes, and scattered notes that assembled on the desk before him. He carefully listened while Kodaira weaved together the narrative he claimed was contained within the formidable, formidable mass of text. Through his whole presentation, he gestured to particularly significant fragments of information, sometimes placing a finger by the key characters and other times handing an entire page to Tachi for closer inspection. He carefully balanced each piece of information on top of another, supported assumptions with pillars of fast facts, and bridged local chasms with carefully constructed hypotheses. Finally, upon reaching the crux of the argument, he had turned to gauge the reaction of his fellow detective. I see what you are pointing out, said Tachi, carefully weighing each word, but doesn't it seem all a bit loose? Kodaro shook his head and replied, that's just it, he said. This kind of case is designed to be loose. In order to crack this thing open, we can't just assume everything will line up one to one. We'll have to figure out where to start or where they start to overlap. That's the point of what we're doing. The parallel approach. It all starts out straight and separate, but eventually it all turns back towards each other. Between what you've been doing and what I've been doing, this is the only point at which it really starts to turn in a way that gives us a real direction. Can we really afford to let slip away? Thought you frowned again. Huh? I guess not. No. Hmm. That sucks. Whatever. Things happen. Curry? Over here, Mijang. Actually, Central Sea. So that is literally all of Mang Mangolia? Mongolia. So I didn't realize this was all literal Mongolia. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm so used to clicking on like the strategic air map mode to see where provinces are at, since Old World Blues has trained me very well. So the death of a taxman. Uh-oh. According to the testimonies and employee reviews provided by the managers of the Tokyo Tax Bureau, Shinji Yoshikage had been the type of accountant that every office dreamed of having. He was ceaselessly diligent and personally invested in the outcome of his projects. A member of the rare breed who sees analysis and manipulations of numbers and values an art form in its own right. It was little wonder then that he had been assigned to such a critical position in the project to restructure the city's tax codes. Though his post was of central importance, he had been regarded as a loner. Most days he arrived early in the morning before everyone else in the department had arrived and remained in his office until well after most had left. The only real interactions people could recall were hurried but polite greetings in hallways, and the endless series of requests for additional documents he made to the lower level staff. But there was no indication that, his, th that this degree of isolation was a result of some grievance he had held against his peers or vice versa. But even so, there seemed to be a strangely large distance between him and the general office systems. Hardly anyone could give a de more detailed description of his actual day-to-day -day work beyond statistical analysis and vague references to the overall goals of the project. This was even the case among the other tax code restructuring project managers and supervisors, implying that nobody had picked up where Yoshikage had left off. The investigation was faced with an important consideration. This was separate. Was it separate due to some property of the wider tax bureau, or was it something about the victim's work itself? Oh. 
Let's go vet, vet the victim's work. Maybe we'll find something there. Maybe we will. Let's go in. It's only 141.2, so it's not much. And that would only be half if we put it to the GDP, so. And actually, our debt grows much lower than our growth, so I'm not too worried about that for now. So, nice. More construction speed. How about we fudge a little number here and there? Some of the parts of the budget are unappealing. If the diet or the public see any of the concerning figures in part of the budget and economic data, there will be unrest and the Kokutai will be in severe danger in order to avoid this. We shall discreetly change some of the statistics in order to maintain absolute stability in Japan after all. Knowing them will only worsen the lives of the people and bring a malaise with the Yama Yamato spirit. More growth, more base efficiency, what's not to love? Oh, look at this, we're pretty... Oh. So, here, Ino is kind of a fascist, you say. Kido is a despot. Takagi is... Takagi is authoritarian democrat. Miki is conservative de democrat. And... Kaya is, well, he's a, he's a national socialist, we'll call it. Postponed proposals. With the help of some report summaries provided by the managers of the Tokyo Tax Bureau, the investigation was able to gain a bit more insight into the actual work that Yoshikage had been doing before he was murdered. While the project as a whole had been focused on the structure of layout of the tax code as a whole, Yoshikage had been fo focused specifically on the industrial commercial side. Within that realm, he seemed to have focused on two particular aspects. The first was an effort to improve the accuracy of tax payment estimations for industrial production facilities in order to cut down on the number of over and under payments that had to be corrected after the fact. This had involved leafing through the records of the largest industrial producers, as well as the Examining current production and profit rates from cooperating companies in order to develop a more accurate estimation system. Beyond this, he had begun to develop a proposal for a system of quarterly reviews for the largest industrial companies to improve market estimations, but it seemed that little progress was made before his death. The second effort was an attempt to streamline and integrate the auditing and tax review processes between the ward offices and central office. From the reports, Yoshikage had begun to develop a radical new system whereby the individual offices would have their authority more closely tied to that of the central office with a more consistent information stream. Therefore, or furthermore, it would eliminate the award responsibilities for some zoned areas entirely, placing them directly under the central bureau instead. However, it seemed that even less progress had been made on the proposal, either the Yoshikage himself noting that the progress had been delayed by the performance of the tax bureau's audit division. Ooh, we need more specifics. Analyze the auditors. Maybe that'd be good. Let's see. Hmm... Little progress. I mean, it, we could maybe do the auditors, I guess. Eh, we'll see if there's anything there. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, man. If we, uh, well, just do that. Why not? The other one seems kind of stuck. But under, crushed underfoot. After the allegations of corruption within the Inu government, student demonstrations had gathered around various locations in Tokyo, with the largest group outside the National Diet Building. They waved placards and wore masks to cover their mouths, like, like us, whilst chanting slogans and chants to mock Prime Minister Eno from the streets. Photographers danced around the boundaries of the groups of protesters, the momentary glare of a camera flash caught these moments in time. Umbrellas freckled throughout the swarm of protesters lifted in a colorful display of green, whites, and reds. The chant and chatter of the streets was booming and the co commotion was shaking. It seemed as if there was little order at all. That was until a horn signaled from the west side of the street and the attention of the tremendous crowd shifted to the left. A great line of horses stood by the west side opening of the street, backed by ranks of what appeared to be Metropolitan Police. They were fitted in deep navy blue armor satchels with small shields and batons and other riot control gear to face the protesters. There was a silence for the moment as the protesters turned to face the police, but as a horn wailed again and the horses charged into the thickness of the crowds, screams began to echo from the streets. The blunt force and violence between the law authority and the protesters descended onto the streets and the hundreds of armed, unarmed students dissipated into the surrounding areas to avoid police bludgeoning and arrests. The violence and screams filled the district, only matched by the hits of water hoses used to punish the protesters further, and the armor-clad police continued to march past the dive building in a regimented hulking trudge. Public approval decreases, we lose political power and stability. Um, I'll put you over here for now. I don't want to touch that. I don't want to lose political power. Really, I don't want to lose stability, but my goodness, there are so many events that it might be an extreme amount of events. I know that the story so far is really, really important, but this, is an, this feels like an extreme amount of events. Because we're already 23 minutes into this, but regardless, the wild ones, Midnight Shinjuki, Juki, Juku, the chilly wind snake through the giant Odaku department stores, but at night the glitzy shopping and finance district turns into something else entirely. Those who cower during the day crawl out of their comfort zones at night, and Aka Nakajima is no different. Lighting a cigarette, Aka heaves and leans back into his precious Midori. But Midori is no schoolmate, neither is she a courtesan. Midori moans louder than any girlfriend Akka's had, and Akka could ride her for hours as much as he pleases. Oh, man. And all there is now is silence until the familiar hums of the other engines come within his earshot. The th three-rev roar was familiar. It was Ryu and the boys from Setagawa. Setagaya. Coolly taking another drag from his cigarette, Akka gesturally warmly, gestures warmly to the older man. How's that scar treating you, you magnificent Mongol slayer? 
quit a kid. You don't know anything until you've been in the crap, replied Ryu dryly. Aka zips up his boiler suit and puts out a cigarette before his hachimaki around his forehead. A sign of rebellion against the state establishment, bikers from Aka take signs of patriotism and own it for themselves. All right, old man, so where am I taking Midori tonight? Out to the ports, other side of Tokyo. If we get there by two, why not ride around Saitama for a bit? The flame of youth is often hard to extinguish. Well, let's see. Oh my god, seriously, another one. Death by thousands and budget cuts. As would happen, the high rate of turnover in the Tokyo Tax Bureau was not quite evenly distributed. While all the departments experienced it to some degree, none would more so than the Audit Division. This was the group responsible for reviewing the tax forms and returns of major institutions and those with suspect records. Ostensibly, they were involved with investigating everything from estate tax payments to currency exchange programs. But unlike the other departments, instead of a constant stream of departures and new arrivals, the auditors seemed to only be faced with departures. Hardly anyone was moved from another department into the Audit Division and any time someone was removed from the division, they were almost always destined to be sent back down to the local war offices. Over the years, the total number of staff had dwindled down to a skeleton crew. Many in the investigation team questioned how the office would perform or could perform its varied and intensive functions with so few resources, but the answer turned out to be painfully simple. They weren't. Hardly anything came out from the division other than occasional allegations of minor fraud or tax evasion, and even those had grown few and far between. Even projects that one would think would require the input of the auditor showed no sign of their involvement, officially. The reason for the division's decline was the increasing redundancy of the department as a whole, and the, and the continued disper dispersion of its functions to more appropriate bodies. This line came from an internal review obtained by the investigation and coincided with a substantial budget slash. But what functions were they referring to? As And if the auditors were not involved, who was? Who indeed? And within a day, we're probably going to get another event, aren't we? I called it. So the green light. A restaurant sits at a street corner, the clashing of pots and boiling of steam emanating from inside. A small woman, firmly gripping her purse, enters the restaurant and walks by the counter, staring at the cooks while doing so. She enters the kitchen, wherein one of the cooks co collects a wadded-up bill from her hand before ushering her down a ladder underneath or hidden underneath some floorboards. She takes a seat in the circle of chairs, unfurling a book from her bag, a poorly manufactured, poorly kept novel about 1920s America, under the scratches and tears, or tears. The title read, The... Uh, the Great Gatsby is supposed to be that one, but so the book club meeting goes by as it does normally. She sits there quietly, listening to others discuss the themes and meanings of Tom Buchanan as a character, or the rosy-colored moving room of page ten and whatnot. The discussion of the first chapter flies by all while she stares down at her copy of the book. Are those eyes she can make out on the cover? Her attention is caught when someone offhandedly mentions the green light in the bay. Well, the translation was unclear, but she was pretty sure that the green light sat under the water of the bay. She raises her voice. After thinking about it, I would guess for what the green light might represent. Looking around, she raises her throat. The green light is both Daisy and the American dream. Gatsby begins his life as a poor man, which is why he can't marry Daisy when he wants to. He works up to a position of wealth, only to find that she, he still can't marry Daisy. Wealth does not change his heritage or his new money personality. Both Daisy and the American dream lie underneath the water, out of reach. It, uh, it represents how the American dream isn't real, the idea that any man can be a par parvenu just isn't true. Money can't break culture and tradition, even in this American golden age. The book club falls silent, even though no one says so. They can't help but make connections of the American dream to themselves. They sit here reading shoddily made novels in the dingy res restaurant basement. The emperor is the master of Asia. They have formed a pan-Asian brotherhood of nations across the Pacific. And yet here they are. Where is the glory? The justice. Not so different. After all. And how about another event? Sorry, if I, I'm sounding a little negative. It's just that we've had so many events. We're still in 1962, like, and I know we're supposed to have the the crash, the Yasuda crisis, I think. So, but my goodness, this is this might be an extreme amount of events so far. The first year of the game, but anyways, finally, the reason for the Tokyo Tax Bureau's reluctance to share specific information about the tax code project came into the light, as someone had implied the bureau's policy of relative silence was less due to the refusal to open its mouth and more due to a butheal a butheal press. A, firmly on its throat. While reviewing the earliest project reports, the detectives came across a section detailing the process of analyzing and proposing regulations for the movement of capital and assets between sphere countries. The section was noteworthy for two reasons. One, Shinji Yoshikage, Yoshikage was designated as the chief analyst on this part of the project, and two, supervision of this particular part was placed under the administration of the Army Ministry, with them having prim primary authorization rights and access to the internal project files on request. Initially, this seemed like an utterly bizarre and arbitrary decision. What did the army have to do with tax reform? But with some more goading, the true role began to take shape. Much of the data involved that with that the part of the project included for information regarding the system and usage of the Japanese military yen, the currency stand in common uh, among the soldiers and civilians of peripheral sphere nations. As it would turn out, the distribution and handling of the military yen had been almost entirely administered by the officers of the Imperial Army. Over time, they slowly acquired more authority over its regulation and international usage, areas that were originally covered by the Audit Department of the Tax Authorities. Recently, in recognition of the change, 
change to the authority was official transfer from the auditors to the army as such they felt it was appropriate for them to be included in the decision making of any initiative involving an institution where they so strictly controlled and none were in any position to argue you otherwise with that the investigation had no choice but to turn to the monolith of military bureaucracy if they were to have any above gaining access to the victim's work well we have our marching orders in which i will be right back all right everyone sorry about that but i had to take a small break from just doing nothing but reading 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 but here we are once again with the rule of two unsurprisingly the army having been granted near absolute authority over the internal systems of the military yen had taken the opportunity to construct the most convoluted system of permissions and security checks imaginable this became clear to the investigation after only a brief foray into the international currency exchange regulations, the military yen was controlled not only by a single office of the Imperial Japanese Army, it was controlled by two, the Army Ministry and the Army General Staff Office Intelligence Division. The Army Ministry, while perhaps being the most direct route given their apparent control over internal policy making for the military yen, would likely not be the easiest. The Ministry was stubborn and seldom gave up information without good reason. Prior communications between them and the police had proven that. However. Given the sprawling nature of the organization and the relatively obscurity of the military yen, the relevant uh, departments may be less wary than the central leadership. The IJA GSO Intelligence Division was another matter. They were a reclusive organization, relinquishing information when it was suited when it suited them, and infamous for sticking in its shadowy or shadowy tendrils in every organization it could reach. Officially, they were administratively beneath the army ministry, but perhaps they would see some benefit in whispering beneath the noses of their political masters. Ooh. Oh, they're pretty shadowy, sticking to its shadowy tendrils in every organization it could reach. Hmm, would that be the easiest? Oh, this is easier than, I guess we'll go with the Ask the I-J-A-G-S-O. We'll see what happens, and we have another focus, finally, that we can do. Let's see, expand lobbying? Eh, that's okay. Wrangle the governor's, governor generals. Yeah, let's do that one. In a misguided effort to preserve law and order, some faraway general or governor general still refused to sign some crucial paperwork. A combination of honesty, gifts, and more direct means should convince them to do the right thing. Well, we'll see what happens right now. Our debt's 470 versus our GDP is 377. So, a measure of intelligence. After a few phone calls between the police... Police's primary contacts in the Army General's staff office and the head detectives, the investigation managed to make contact with a public-facing officer who, according to the contacts, knew just enough to help them out. After another phone call or two, this time with one of the relevant officers who preferred not to give his family name, that was revealed to be only somewhat true. For the most part, the only information the Intelligence Division could give them was how little information they actually had. Per the testimony of the intelligence officer, the part of the division concerned with the military yen actually had only one real function in that respect, tracking the distrib distribution and rough movement of the military notes as it moved about the sphere. As far as he knew, which he assured the detectives was rather far, the whole intelligence division didn't have a single file concerning the actual exchange of individual notes, just the movement of set quantities of bills from one place to another. To make matters worse... <coughs> The officer could not even assure the detectives that they would be able to see the files for themselves either. However, to the surprise, he assured them that he would do his best to track down those who had the exchange files and report back to them. Apparently, he had suspected something a foul in the system for some time and was determined to bring an end to it one way or another. God speak, Officer Shinzo. Good luck. Maybe his name, his last name is Abe. Probably not, but you never know. You never know. Cool, so we have one, two, three, four, which is nice, and then some. Yeah, I'm going to have another one being made here, then we're going to do five factories, but constant changes after a few days of a patient waiting. Intelligence officer Shinzo had yet to report back for the investigation or either of its head de lead detectives. Even more concerning, one of the detectives was fed up with waiting. They even attempted to break in themselves, but none of their calls were even answered. Kodara began to suspect that the whole thing had been a wild goose chase or the officer's off-record assignment had gone awry. Tachi, Tachi, on the other hand, had not entirely lost hope and maintained that they should give the intelligence officer a few more days before coming to a hasty, any hasty conclusions. Sure enough, just a day later, at around half past four in the afternoon, just as Tachi was about to step out of the door to leave for the day, the desk phone rang. Rang. After scurrying it to pick it up, the detective was greeted by the reassuring voice of Officer Shinzo. He was happy to report that by com combing through the files and conversing with some of his colleagues, he managed to track down the military yen exchange records as well as the office that controlled them. The answer caught Tachi by surprise, so much so that he had to ask the officer to repeat what he said in order to make sure he hadn't misheard him. All records and accounts concerned with the specific exchanges of military notes were not under the control of the army at all, and they were actually under the control of the navy. The navy's general staff office, to be exact. Does anyone actually know how this government works? Obviously not. And that's okay, because we got these guys. Ooh, Eno has lost quite a bit of support, which is not bad. Ooh, but we're still we're still conservative, but we do want to go with liberalism. I want to cut down you guys as well. Let's cut you down. Let's lose some attack publicly. Might as well. Discredit the faction. Why not? 70? I don't want to spend money to do that stuff, though. Good. Oh, this is a guy, these guys are getting pretty big. Miki? Oh, we can't do that yet, so that's fine. And over here, 
the, uh, the Navy has a lot more support. Paranoia. I don't want a lot of paranoia. I want to actually decrease paranoia. If we lose support that way, because, oh, it's either raise up the army support or lower the navy support. Mm, more money, more support from both. A lot less paranoia. Mm, minus 40%. Wow. What we could do is... Mm, we have the things going on right now. Let's, let's wait. Let's just wait. It's probably best. We're unpopular, which is good because we don't want Eno right now. Eno's a cool dude and all, but we'll see what happens. Budget minus 2.2 billion. Ah, I love it. Choosing a lead with a list of details and various leads of the case growing ever longer and beginning to twist and intertwine with each other. The investigation was beginning to find its resources to spread them. Furthermore, the parallel investigation method that had served them so well at the start was now beginning to cause the various teams to stumble over each other and on more than one occasion found themselves uncovering or dealing with redundant information. To that end, the two head detectives decided it was time to simplify the investigation process by pursuing one lead in particular. They figured that if the leads already overlapped as much, then following one to its end should lead to the resolution of all of them. It just came down to choosing which was the best one to follow. Shipping, Ministry, IJN, GSO lead. Um, I'm not really sure which one to choose. Hmm. IJN? Well, we'll probably go with that one since it seems to be working so far, right? Right? And Turkestan has defeated Karakal Pakistan. Wow. Nova Polska. I can't wait to get contact someday. Uh, Hey, base bleed, no, it's a base bleed, 50s artillery rocket assisted projectiles, the IJNGSO. The Imperial Navy, J the Imperial Japanese Navy General Staff Office was a stubborn and independent department, even by Japanese, Imperial Japanese standards. They staunchly refused to answer to any authority but that of the Emperor by means of the Imperial Guard headquarters, and even now that leash had begun to grow slack. Their performance against the Allied navies and the lauding they received from the public and the afterglow of victory had only emboldened them further, allowing them to secure a measure of political power on their own. We have another division here, huh? Cool. This meant that they were regarded as an entirely separate beast from the monolithic Navy Ministry, where the Army Ministry and General Staff Officer were generally regarded as the two faces of the same machine. The Navy Ministry often found itself blustering and stumbling after the Navy General Staff Office while they seemed to head without a single gosh darn about the political ramifications of their policies. While the office's uh, responsibilities were technically limited to those concerning operational command, in reality, this gave them a far-reaching and broadly defined authority over Imperial seagoing affairs. Given this huge sprawl of, of administration, the investigation would need to be very precise in the inquiries. What are the bureaucrats hiding? What is the office's role in the military yen? Hmm... I'm not really sure which one to choose. Ooh... Let's go with the role in the military yen, why not? At least we can get some more tech done. Kind of nice. Anything here? That's uh, barely ahead of time. Armor stuff? We don't have that much armor, do we really? Light aircraft. Let's grab some drop tanks. Those are always good to get. Drop tanks are always nice. Slash budget. There we go. Not much, but you know what? If we can get down below two, 470 billion, that's not bad. Two hunches and a gut feeling. While well, the investigation now understood that the primary administrative authority over affairs concerning the military yen had been handed over to the Imperial Navy in general, what was not clear was how this authority was actually being bureau bureaucratically administered. Now officially, the Navy Ministry and General Staff Office were the two faces of the same mind, but in reality there existed a considerable degree of separation between them, symptoms even resulting in internal tensions. Clearly the Ministry was involved with representing the management of the military yen in the political realm, but what was the IJNGSO's role? The investigation did have some vague understanding of some of the staff officers' responsibilities based on their prior inquiries. It was clear that they were involved with the physical movement of the military banknotes for one thing, likely for security reasons. This, in turn, suggested that they also must have some form of banknote records for the purposes of redundancy and security checks. Of, the, of these two supposed responsibilities, the latter appeared to be more infor informationally, informationally relevant to the lead detectives, but they were still faced with a simple yet formidable obstacle. They did not actually know where the such files were kept. Previous failed inquiries combined with the restrictive measures enacted by the various offices had failed to provide an obvious path to accessing these records. If the investigation was to succeed in this lead, they would first need to get past square one. Find me those files. Well, we'll see what happens. Tomsk is looking pretty big. Big old Tomsk. Ah, uh, yes. Lakayachev. Dmitry Lekakyov. Okay. The only thing worse than silence. The two head detectives of the investigation did get their answers from the Navy General Staff Office about the whereabouts of the military yen banknote files, but the answer they received was far more troublesome than the question it was intended to answer. It was the kind of answer that men like Kodara and Tachi couldn't respond to just because it resonated with an almost extensive... 
Ah, oh, my goodness. Existential worry. It was a kind of answer one whispered into half-empty glass beers or while turning a carton of cigarettes to ash. The answer was that there was basically no files. At first, the representative who spoke to the two detectives over the phone sounded sheepish like he was being forced to cover for some mistake. But as the call went on, it became clear that the representative's weakness was attempting was him attempting to be polite while correcting what he perceived to be an obvious misunderstanding on the part of the detectives. According to the staff office, the files they were asking for only really ever temporarily existed at best or existed only in theory at worst. Furthermore, they claimed that the real purpose of the military yen was to facilitate regional military industrial development and then expecting it to have all the records and controls associated with the proper currency was expecting too much out of the military currency entirely. This was essentially an echo of similar sentiments that the officers and detectives of the investigation had received earlier that they were dealing with a relic of Japanese administration, a forgotten footnote of financial policy, but if it were really to be so irrelevant, why did it seem to be packed into every layer of the case? I can't except that I won't. The 1963 to Tohoku Winters. Tohoku had always been one of the hardest hit regions in Japan when it comes to snowfall and winter. But this year, snowfall in the region, northern region has hit harder than usual. In particular, Amori Prefecture has received record breeding snowfalls exceeding 1,200 centimeters, with the depth exceeding 150 centimeters. Across all of Japan, individual charity initiatives through, uh, through word of mouth, religious organizations, as well as political associations went on a charity offensive calling for snowfall relief equipment and necessary donations. The prefectural government, for all intents and purposes, seemed to be overwhelmed by the natural disaster that fallen upon Aomori. We have received a barrage of phone calls and telegrams from the prefecture, and the Ministry of T Transportation and Communications in charge of Japan's meter to Meteorological research has called upon the Council of the Prime Minister when snowfall hits. Standard excavation and recovery vehicles are used, tractors, snow plows, as well as civilian volunteers who dig through the snow with shovels. This is standard operating procedure for the government, but the central government would take several days to mobilize the proper equipment for the task. Of note, however, is a proposal from Amori's regional military commander called to mobilize the prefecture's res reserve units and clear the snow with military hardware, but we should really heavily consider the consequences of such a call. Maybe the boys got a bright idea. Don't be silly. Yeah, we're gonna take the hit. Let's not get the military involved for now. That'd probably be good. Minus 2.3 billion, not bad. Good slash civilian spending, but we good. Let's see. Oh, hey, not bad. 30%, not bad at all. Hokkaido. Where do we want to put this right now? Hopefully Japan never becomes... Japan. Uh, Korea never becomes independent. I'm gonna put it where... On the mainland first, so... Boom, Kyoto. And then boom, right there. Very little is going to be worked on here, but that's okay. The liaison. With the detective's leads quickly becoming to run short, more decisive, stronger actions became more and more appealing. The implicitly shadowy nature of the Imperial Navy's involvement with the financial conglomerates and international commercial interests made it extremely difficult for the investigation to track down relevant information. Beyond that, given the number of different sub-companies and proxy deals that the Navy dealt with, it was almost impossible to direct their focus at one particular office for maximized results. Almost. In their inquiries, the detectives stumbled upon an obscure organization whose name appeared in hardly any documents from the Imperial Cabinet during during the war, an administrative structure was created to coordinate operations between civilian government and military bureaucracies, the Imperial General Headquarters Government Liaison Conference at the time. This had granted some degree of administrative control over commercial and industrial shipping moments or movements. After the war, it was seemed that the Navy had particularly enjoyed this newfound power and so successfully lobbied for the creation of a similar body, the Imperial General Headquarters Industrial Interest Liaison Conference. Wow, that's a mouthful. This body, staffed by key officers from both branches of the military and representatives from approved financial conglomerates, was ostensibly in charge of reviewing and handling the processes related to military contracts. Apparently, they were responsible for overseeing the financial logistics as well as ensuring security and legal directives that were adhered to. If there was ever such a Department of State to hit with a general administrative audit, this was it. But it's going to be have to be a big one. If that's the case, let's come over. Oh, we're unpopular. Well, that's good. Let's see. I'm going to slash their budget. Or, that's only minus 25 million. I'd rather just raise the support of the IJA then. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, what is this one? Promote officers. We'll get a little bit more paranoia, but that's okay. Promote that. Decrease them. I don't care. So that's a little better. Slashing the budget. We can't slash them too much more. Demote officers. That's probably They're not going to like us that much. But, okay, so now it's a little bit more unbalanced. That's okay. Now, let's see. We are at 36%. If I do this, we lose a lot of support. But that's okay, because we want Eno gone. Now there's no paranoia. We've done it. There's no paranoia, but we've no we don't have a lot of support here. Thumbs up for me. Cool. Hey, Wrangle the Officer's General. Sanctity in obscurity, but we'll first do the la la expand lobbying. Our diet has many issues to contend with and is far more all from all knowing. Lobbying from industries and interest groups shall be expanded to allow for greater understanding of the correct path for Japan's future, far from the radical ideas of Japan hating elements. See construction what are they Good, 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 good. 
And, oh wait, I didn't want to close that one yet. Not bad, not bad. Pretty good, I'd say, so far. Sanctity and obscurity. The obscure nature of the Imperial Guard Headquarters' industrial interests liaison conference made it somewhat difficult to get a proper grasp of them in order to conduct a proper audit. As the rather inconvenient name implied, it was less of an organization in its own right and more of an administrative overlap between two prior existing organizations. The roles and function of the Imperial General Headquarters were well known to the investigation staff. It was a body responsible for coordinating policy and operations between two branches of the military and was directed by the offices of the Emperor himself. The industrial interest liaison was a different story, however. It was a loose council of industrial and financial representatives and experts that seemed to have been formed specifically to be part of the conference organization. The actual members of the liaison, however, had to be approved by the Imperial General Headquarters before the conference could convene, but in many cases approved could be substituted with selected without much loss of accuracy when dealing with the IGH, leaving the detectives to question the liaison's real independence. Either side of the conference was considered to be a viable path to investigate, however, each came with their own challenges. For one, they could focus on the military side of the conference, mostly concerned with the logistics of international shipping. Alternatively, they could turn to the industrial liaison, who were likely to be the dominant party in the financial negotiations, and examine the actual contracts that had been agreed upon. We're going to go with industrial contracts. I want business. we got to examine the businesses. we got to make sure that they're okay. I always open this up, the economy tab, just to feel good about myself sometimes. I don't know why. Just like, as long as we're progressing toward things, that's good, but Joe Tzu. Kenzu was no stranger to his heavy snow, but even so, it was nothing compared to the snowfall he was experiencing now in Amori. He shriveled miserably as the wind brazenly grazed his face. Snow belted him, carpeting his thick jacket and pants as Kenzu exult exhaled. He breathed instantly turned his breath instantly turned to mist in front of him, and even while wearing gloves, his fingers were growing numb and losing sensation. He had no choice, however, but to trudge on. Kenzu clutched his spade tightly as he stared at the large snowy mound in front of him. It was tall, reaching up to his chest. He tapped, he tapped it lightly, to which he did not budge in the slightest, gritting his teeth. Kenzu moved his shovel to and fro as pieces of ice and dirt brushed his face. His face. For several minutes later, the once towering pile of snow lay in pieces at his feet, smirking weakly. Kenzu leaned against the nearby wall to recover. Half strength was exhausted on that one mound, what more of the rest. As Kenzu tried to catch his breath, the young lady walked up to him, carrying some hot water. Here, she said, passing a cup to Kenzu. You'll need it. You've got a tough job ahead of you, but you're doing well. Keep it up, remarked the girl as he, she twirled around to head back. So, thank you, replied Kenzu sheepishly. He was unsure if the lady heard his reply, but it didn't matter now. Slipping on the water, Kenzu felt its warmth spreading throughout his body, his sense of touch returning as it loosened his frozen joints. He laughed mildly, grabbed his shovel once more. Their work was far from finished. Marching in the snow, stepping on ice, 2% more... Oh my god, what happened to our stability? What happened? Oh wait, weekly change. Oh, oh boy. Oh, I see. Um, Where is it? Sense of... Wait, why are we losing stability now? We're losing weekly stability by minus 0.3. Oh, public approval's down. Oh, then whatever. Hidden in plain sight. Every year, the brave men that fought to defend Japan needed a vast array of supplies. It wasn't much of a surprise in that a vast array of companies were needed to supply the soldiers both in Japan and abroad. The Industrial Interest Liaison supposedly serves as an independent arbiter of this process, overseeing contracts and the money behind them. While in practice, the II or IIL appears to be a mere proxy of Army and Navy interests, this diligent book keeping might be of great use to the investigation. The police department was not surprised to see that the organization's diligence and record keeping did not extend to diligence in cooperating with the police. Rumors of the investigation might reach the men of the liaison office, or perhaps the usual contempt for a civilian administration delayed the transfer of documents. The reason for the military's men and grouchy behavior quickly became apparent when the team began sifting through the documents. The surprising scale of military yen use in supplying and shipping contracts rapidly came to light. In some months, 3 to 5 percent of procurement contracts used it. In shipping contracts, the proportion reached 20 percent in sometimes in, in sometimes periods. Uh, while the currency was legal tender and the army was perfectly in its right to use it, it was truly bizarre to see that as much see that much mili military money sloshing around bank accounts on the home island. It certainly complicated the payment of contracts as conversion offices became essential to the audit team's growing unease. A specific office treated almost all the conversion to regular money. A popular office? Please, sir, I just want to cut down the deficit. That's all I want to do and maybe grow the GDP. Yeah, I really want to grow the GDP. That'd be nice. Can't believe we're losing almost four stability a week. Preferential exchange rates. Every new actor in this vast web of conspiracy has just to complain and obstruct every step of the way. The Army, Navy, and Seafood Plant, the government government offices, and now an obscure money changing financial office in the back streets of Gina. Ginza Ward. It was at least a refreshing change of pace to have some hapless civilians to shout at. Without any army or navy protection, the bean counters at the exchange offices were ob obligated to cooperate fully. The detectives bulldozed through delays and attempts of misdirection to gain the full list of military currency conversion for the past few years. The employees were left days in the wake of the police investigation as cartloads of precious confidential data was brought off to the 
PlayStation. Preliminary reports do not make it clear why this particular currency exchange was favored. The institution was well regarded but not best or biggest in town. The investigation team finally began to look at the timing of the transactions themselves. A few delays in the currency exchange appeared here and there on the military contract list by comparing them with arcane reports. On the official exchange rate of the military yen, it soon became evident that the conversion to the regular yen had always been quite advantageous. The few percents of difference that the office secured when converting the military contract added up to quite a tidy sum for all the army contractors that agreed to get paid in military money, especially to the shipping partners in the, in the Navy, turning the military yen to civilian gold. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, what? What? No, 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 no. no. Open up, come on. Open up. We gotta slash the budget. 0.9 a day. Woof! Less than 50% stability. The well is finished. The isolated gray machines with its black shadow that coated the icy landscape once stood alone. Yet it was eventually joined by a second. The construction did not go quite as planned as this time. The foundation, thought to be firmly secured to the ground, gave way. The structure buckled under its own weight and tilted into the water before coming, finally coming to a rest lopsided and halfway into the icy water. Fortunately, the seemingly considerable setback could be resolved with the use of additional funds from the government. All would be restored soon to the working order apart from that which came at the loss of human life. Once the iron frame was properly attached and secured, the mechanisms could finally be welded into their proper places. After about a month of delays, the oil rig was finally finished, joining its twin in their much-valued purpose. The icy waters of Karafuto seemed to grow darker as production ramped up. At the same time, the increase in oil production lifted the spirits of Sasakawa and the Prime Minister Hor Hiroya Ino. Despite the setbacks, additional funding had allowed for another rig to be built. Even more oil would now be available for the government to utilize. Karafuto did eventually benefit from the oil wells. The money from the new industry helped to modernize both the once entirely agricultural economy and the settlements of the Karafuto as well. Toyo Har developed into a prosper town, or prosper town, proper town, with a matching port. Immigration rose significantly as the oil attracted those who sought to even find more of the precious resource. While the oil fields grew and tarnished the landscape somewhat, the people of Kara Karafuto Prefecture took solace in the precious comforts it had brought them. A close call, but good enough in the end. I wondered when we were going to get more oil when we tried to do more stuff in Karafuto. The business partners. A conclusion almost too absurd to be true. The army and navy legendary for the intense rivalry both within Japan and without are secretly business partners. This is at least the conclusion our data points to. There's simply too much money floating around Around these two organizations. Some things remain uncertain, of course. Why would the Navy accept to be paid in piles of military yen that ultimately tie them to their hated rivals? And why would the Army try to dissuade their widespread use of the Navy's commercial ships? The investigation team needs to shift its attention to the Army once again. The careful public story it built was beginning to unravel. Hidden in the chain of military procurement contracts was a strong evidence that the investigation needed, but what would its cost be? At the end of another long day of work, Detectives Kodera and Tachi shared a final cigarette before departing home. It had become something of a ritual for the men to share some quiet time at the end of the day to clear their mind. That evening, however, both men could tell the other remained uneasy. The deeper they and their team descended into the abyss, the more endless it became around them. Both men could only hope that they could live to see light on the other side. A storm broods on the horizon. I wonder what it could be. And my friends, we've almost done it. We've almost gotten to a brand new year. It only took us almost close to the end of the third episode to get through 1962. Now, I know it's on TNL, but my goodness, outsourced great supply chains. It turns out that the Army had been outsourcing the supply chains for quite some time. This, while this has kept costs from spiraling out of control, it represents an unacceptable breach of security and diversion from protocol. We've captured the worst offenders, and they've given us enough intel now that we have a choice to make. We can choose to inspect the supply routes by land, which would involve the private armored car company that have been moving products and payments alike. Alternatively, we can inspect the supply routes by sea, which would require securing a vessel transporting Army goods, which should we inspect? Ooh, sea routes, land routes. Hmm. Well, hmm. I like armored cars, I do. Vessel transporting army goods. Let's go with sea routes, just because we basically have to use sea routes to get anywhere, pretty much, unless we go through, like, Korea down here in Fusan or Busan. The Mighty Adam. Every Tuesday, millions of boys and girls across Japan gather in front of TV sets in order to appear into another world. The world they glimpse through is that those hazy screens and is a brighter one where war is absent and wondrous technologies ease the burdens of mankind. One such technology is robotics and one such robot is Adam. Mighty Adam is a creation of the master cartoonist Osamu Tezuka, who had been crafting comics starting the boy robot since 1952. Built to replace a scientist's dead son, Adam was discarded by his father and forced to survive on his own, but, but despite his cruel treatment and despite his artificial nature, Adam was defined by his kindness and his humanity. Through his heart beats, Although his heart beats with the awesome power of nuclear energy, he rarely resorts to violence. He lends aid to the distress and stands up to the wicked. Though the comic had been popular, the show produced by himself. Uh, it is the first animated TV series produced in Japan, and it made Adam known to, from Nagasaki to Hokkaido. At its height, Ad Mighty Adam was watched by over 40% of Japanese households that own a TV. 
The whole ministry even partnered with the, with Tezuka to translate Mighty Adam for audiences across the sphere so that they can admire this new form of art. But it remains to be seen if the partnership will hold since Mighty Adam is far from the triumphalist propaganda the ministry tends to produce. Though full of action and adventure, Adam's world is a kinder one that are, than of our own. One worth striving for. The show is welcoming despite these trying times. Come on, let's get to crisis, crisis, come on. Pay it off so we can still have a little bit of money left here. Yay, we got below 470 billion. Huzzah. And the boat raid. The vessel is easy enough to trace. Kodera and Tachi have been involved long enough to, with it to recognize its markings. What is difficult is con concocting a sufficient and viable cause for the raid, especially one done as far away as from the jurisdiction as this one. After poring over paperwork, it is, after all, the first step in any Japanese official office procedure. A case is found that does not violate jurisdiction and will not alarm the Navy or Army. Food hygiene. The crew of the ship had ample evidence to suggest that they are well fed, but what is missing is a requisite cleaning and hygiene material that must accompany food. There is no trace of it in the empty manifests. By Navy and civilian standards, this is a violation of regulation, and since the food they eat is traceable to a warehouse near Tokyo, it can be claimed that there is due cause. The team readies its gear and prepares to strike the ship and dock. Most of the crew will be out on shore leave, and only a skeleton crew headed by the captain remains, which is suspicious in itself. Most captains would happily pass a task to their underlings. The documents are requisitioned, and a case is drawn up. At the break of the dawn, the next day they move for the ship. Maybe we can dig something out of this. Oh boy. Walsh Unionists win elections. Well, that's nice. Congrats, guys. Hope you enjoy your victory. Hope you do. Support companies. Don't mind if we do. We're still working on our land doctrine. Let's grab some tactical support next. Thank you very much. And see what happens. Here's the captain's log. Well, we'll do that once we get some more stuff down here. Scout helicopters? Why not? The captain's log. The crew are civilian, multinational, and very easily cowed. Tachi tries not to think about the implications of their fear. After all, the sphere is merciful to its people, and so is the Empire. In any case, they are very easily subdued. The one person on board who attempts resistance is the captain. After a brief scuffle, the reason is discovered. The captain is uncooperative himself. What is revealing is his quarters. He has a safe in his office, a small, black, locked. The appropriate threats of judicial action are used, and the key is requisition. And the real itinerary of the ship, one the ones containing the autonomous or anonymous cargo, is found. Of course, withholding inventory manifest from port authorities is not only a serious offense; it is a punishable one by order of the port authority, with sanction for an actual legal case conducted all the way in Tokyo. After explaining the technicalities of the situation, the captain is coerced. Well, he is persuaded. Same difference. He points to a nondescript army warehouse not too far from the harbor itself and located right on the first stop of the journey, where the boat is scheduled to perform routine resupply and repair work. Uh, the team readies its documents. If they are to find anything in the, this part of the Empire, they will find it there. That was surprisingly easy. At least that was easy, right? We only 40% stability, but ah, uh, stability, just like GDP. Whatever, jet, dad, stability, same thing. The warehouse. Tachi and Kodaira finally find themselves at the entrance of the warehouse. It had been quite the journey to get here, and Kodaira comments that it would likely not be worth the while. Just another dead end or another tiny chain in the endless ink, or link. Tachi remains silent and approaches to the door, oh, to open the door, not only to be stopped by a warehouse worker. He tells them that they are not authorized to enter and that they would be best leaving off. Tachi flashes his credentials, but the worker does not budge. Annoyed, Tachi goes on a long rant until the worker finally gives in nervously and allows the two detectives to pass inside. The two are initially rather curious and then confused and completely shocked. The warehouse is completely empty. The two detectives both walk around for a moment in stunned silence, looking for anything at all. Weapons, supplies, the kind of things that they have been tracking to find in this place. They find not a single box of shells in the entire building. They immediately begin pulling aside and questioning the truly mi minute skeleton crew, who dodge every question and refuse to give a straight answer to even the most basic queries. Kodara eventually demands to see actual documents and records, but is still denied. Tachi goes to investigate the office anyways, but finds nothing. Even after prying open locked cabinets, he finds no records and no real documentation at all. Kodaira and Tachi eventually gather what they can and prepare to head back. They found so much and so much less than they hoped at the same time. Oh my goodness. First quarter. Oh, let's get there. I like that. A lot more civilian factories, huh? We have four days left for our focus. Hopefully it can go well. But like most things here, let's see what happens. Paralyze. Tachi and Kodaira eventually return with what they have found, plunging the entire investigation team into complete and utter shock. This has just become much bigger than they realized or really ever wanted. And they finally cross the regular threshold of risk to a point where their safety may be compromised. They're very clearly important very important, and very high-ranking people who would be willing to take drastic measures to keep this quiet, whatever this really was. The debate soon proves to be extremely divisive. Many become worried about whether they might be in too deep, and if they might just be best to drop the whole thing. Others insist that the only way to ensure their own safety is to continue to press hard pressing harder. Every moment of this loose end stays united or are you untied. They become more at risk of retaliation from those that are being investigated. The only sure way to be both safe and make sure that the justice is served is to strike first. The debate carries on for hours as investigators pour over them information, reading, reading and rereading every line, coming over everything that has been gathered as of yet to try and glean some clue as to what we must do next. Eventually, however, one conclusion is reached. Something has to be done. This case cannot go cold. The only way to figure out exactly what to do, we are trading in dangerous territory. Cool. The first quarter, report. 
The Ministry of Commerce and Industry will publish a paper that outlines the advancements and economic growth of the empire and the co-prosperity sphere in the last 10 years. The paper boldly states that the post-war is over, as Japan has now healed the wounds of the nations of Asia that have long suffered under Western colonialism and oppression. From here, Japan and with it, Asia will enter a new age of prosperity and harmony. Yes, get us those eight civilian factories. Ooh, more political power and riches continue. Our economy will be shining model for the rest of the world. I like that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Nothing bad can happen here, right? Too crazy to work. After hours of debate and scheming, Tachi finally speaks up with a truly insane idea. This is clearly much deeper than anticipated. The military is involved somehow. If they do not act soon, they could be in the sights of some very powerful and very dangerous people. Thus, the only course of action is to strike fast and, more importantly, strike hard. If the suspects will not cooperate, then then which they have shown they have no plans to do. Then the investigators will have to get used to the smoking guns themselves. A vulnerable military base, one assigned to the unit which within or which the warehouse supposedly belonged to, a quick raid in and out, and the criminals exposed before they can so much file a complaint. Cordero listens thoughtfully, as many are aware of the plan, he speaks in favor of it at the end. He talks about the contacts he has made over the years, people who could get the men and supplies necessary for such an ambitious operation, people who have dealt with unsavory and dangerous things before. Cordero, after all, one of the most seasoned members of the team. Tachi thinks Cordero, but insists he knows of his own plan, uh, and the people he wants to carry it out. He is young, fresh, the wild card, the people he might know are stranger, more on the fringe, and perhaps more unique and more unexpected to do to both the team and to their foes. His ideas are innovative but untested. The team is weary, but many think his tenacity will bring him to victory. Eventually, it is brought to a vote. A season in all well versus heels who will find his allies. Get an enemy where they least expected. Mm, we could be, be we could be watched right now as we're going through all the stuff. Ooh, he is a little bit more experienced. So let's go with Kodairas, just because he seems a little bit more experienced. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Can I request Garrison, Garrison support from these guys? That'd be kind of cool. I can, but no. The old dog. The investigators decided that Kodera, as the most experienced of the detectives, should be the one to seek out allies. Tachi accepts his judgment without only a little argument, and Kodera thanks the team and promises not to let them down. He quickly heads off to his office and begins rooting through his files to find names and numbers. After a good search, he starts to make some calls. He skips formalities and makes it clear that this is a dire situation he cannot disclose too much to get his contacts to understand. This is not the first time they've had to exercise discretion, though they note that Kodaira is more grim and urgent than he's ever been before. They direct him to names who direct him to other names who give him numbers who give him info. He eventually gets a few key names, numbers, and addresses and heads out. He finds two potential allies that interest him the most. The first are a police few policemen in the Tokyo Police Department who are personal friends of Kodaira. Though he suspects a conspiracy may even reach as a police as a police department, he and he would and has trusted these friends with his life, and they can gather the non-corrupted and loyal officers of the department. The other contact is riskier, but perhaps more rewarding. He has managed to gather a short list of discontent and slightly hot-headed officers who do much for chance for advancement. They could use their involvement against this conspiracy as a chance to take the places of any higher-ranking officers that lose their positions. Reach out to these officers. Power, power is a powerful incentive. The men of the department will be our allies. Ooh. I think the men of the department will be our allies. I mean, that seems pretty... Pretty normal. So... And hot-headedness could get you in a lot of problems. Could, could benefit you quite a bit, but could be a lot of problems. But we'll go through one more event, and then we'll call it an episode. Oh, cool. The police contacts, cool. And thank you. Not that much money, and we're going to do this as well. And... Hmm... Boom. So, <clears throat> police contacts. The civilian police has never been the most powerful institution in Imperial Japan, but it does have its own set of influence. Without the constant monitoring of criminal groups and round the clock vigilance of the elite Toku police, the order and progress prized by every Japanese might become a very distant dream instead. Or indeed. The civilian police's ability to get crime solved without endless internal politics of the various military po polices was also a league of its own. Making use of this influence to cover the investigation would, however, be, be quite tricky. There's no way to tell how deep the tendrils of the Navy and Army reach inside the department. But the investigation units had its own allies. The gravity of the unfolding conspiracy would also help convince more conservative members of the police department to throw their weight behind the idea of an evidence-collecting raid. And so the investigation team worked, filtering every police officer into reliable and unreliable groups. When the time came to show cards, a surprising proportion of the Tokyo Police Department was for were forecasted to stand behind the investigation team. Time to go see your boss. <clears throat> and I'm going to conclude today's episode there because this video has gone on long enough. I apologize earlier for being a little ranty about, you know, just like reading too much, but we've barely gotten to February 1st, 1963, in the end of the third episode. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when things might just end up collapsing. Thanks for watching, though, and have a great rest of your day.